ポケットたらつまいらわかへけきてやわこわいたけれてれねえれれれれれれぶた「きてもはなこがたいファカツアクペ」「こがたいファカツアクペ」A tēnā tātou e whakakao nei i raro i hua tēnei te aroha tango i o ngā mano. Uh, kia whakatūwhera tēnei kaupapa i roto i te reo karakia anō reira me ino i tātou. E hono re kuro re he mau ngarongo ki rongi te whenu whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katu. Hanga e te atu e ngā kau mā whakahutia he wairu o tiki ki roto ki a mātou. Tēnei au pununga tāne pununga wahini tuko whakamoe me ti ine ki a koe e pā. Kia tau pokina te koroa aroha ki ronga ki ngā whānau e mpauri ana e maui ana. I roto i ngā whārua rua, i roto i ngā tihi puta no ao te arua whānui tonu. Toro mai aru i ngā kahaki rongo ki a mātou i tēnei wā ki whakabā mātou arahi mō i a mātou i tēnei a i ahi pō. Ko koe tērē te atu e whakakahi o mātou, wairua i o mātou ngā kau. Tēnei nō tīna atu ki a koe e pā. Rōri ki tō i ngua tapu. Amine. Amine. Kia hora tō marino, kia whakapapa pauna me tō moana he huarahi mā tātou o te kōnei. Aroha atu maro mai, tātou i a tātou katō tēnā tātou. I tēnei wāka hino waki au, kia koe e te atu a kia tau mai, au manaki tana ki runi a mātou. Kia kura wai hea e koe mātou, te kura wai o te aroha, kia noho hau maru hoki i nga wāka tō. Tēnei te mihi atu kia koutou i nga rangatira, i nga kaitō rangapū. Mauri a mai. O koutou mano, o koutou kōrero, o koutou whakapono ki waina nui a tātou. Kia mana ai nga kōrero i taia e mātou te kapo atu. O ku mātou te wai mai e hei pai arahi rātou hoki e nga rangatira ki a koutou katoa. A koutou e hui hui mai nei, ki te tautoko te karanga o te pō, ki te tohatoa i o koutou whakaaro, 
o mohi o tana hei awhina i a tātou tēnā hoki kākitau. Nā mātou e kaweta mana o te tamata toi a uwi, kia hiri te whakaaro, uh, ki te whakatau toko i a koutou nga tohu nga mahi toi, mahi auha tanga, ki te whakatūtuki i a koutou mawata. Uh, me ki tā mātou whakatau ki, whae a te toi, uarewa o te auaha tanga, hei ki te toi toi manua mo tana ki makaurei. Anō reira, tēnā tātou kato. Uh, kia ora tātou. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Heta Hudson. I am the chair of Te Taumata Toi A Iwi, the Auckland Regional Arts Trust, and I have the privilege of welcoming and thanking you all for joining us tonight. Uh, first, a warm welcome to our, our guest speakers, uh, the Honourable Carmel Sibuluni, Associate Minister of Arts, Culture and Heritage for the Labour Party, Jonathan Young, National Party MP and Spokesperson for Arts, Culture and Heritage, and Chloe Swarbrick, Green Party MP and Spokesperson for Arts, Culture and Heritage. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to thank Miriama for kindly supporting tonight's kaupapa. Uh, nō reira, e te manu tī ori ori o Aoraki Raua ko Taranaki, tēnei te mihi atu, kia mihi kauana ki a koe. Nau te kutu whakaari me te āhua tanorau tīrama o te pōnei. Also, tonight could not have been made possible without the support of our partners, uh, including Open Live, the spin-off, and the big idea. E kore te mutuna nā mihi ki a koutou kato. Whilst tonight's forum has been convened by Te Taumata Toi A Iwi, we do this on behalf of Ngā Toi Advocacy Network. It's, a, it's our collective goal to amplify the voices that champion the value and impact of creativity, arts and culture in our communities. In part, we do this by taking the opportunity to bring policymakers and the creative community closer together to better understand and co-create strategies that support a vibrant creative arts and culture ecosystem in Tamaki Makaurau. Uh, therefore, without, without further ado, to our speakers, thank you once again for showing your support for the creative sector, and we look forward to hearing your vision for creativity in Tamaki Makaurau. So at this time, I'll hand it over to you, Miriama. Kia ora. Tēnā koe he te arauranga tira mā tēnā koutou katoa. Ia e kūranga tira te kai karaki e te kai uh, whakatau. Uh, tēnā koro he te raua ko inon. A mana whenua, mana tangata tēnā tātou katoa, ko Auraki, ko Taranaki, o Kumaunga, ko Ngaitahu, ko Ngāti Mutunga, o Kuiwi, ko Miriama Kam o tōku ingoa. A nā reira, e te iwi tēnei te mehinu, nui ki a koutou tēnā koutou tēnā koutou tēnā ra koutou katoa. Well, welcome everyone to this election forum, which has been hosted, is being hosted by Te Tau Matatoi a Iwi and convened by Ngā Toi Advocacy Network. Uh, Kei te mihi nui uh, kia I sign, Deaf Aotearoa, and particularly Melody and Stephanie, who are signing tonight on behalf of our deaf community in this New Zealand Sign Language Week. Um, I'll add my mihi to our partners, the spin-off, The Big Idea, and Auckland Live, and of course, no my haramai to our uh, politicians tonight, Jonathan Young, Chloe Swarbrick, and Carmel Sikuluni. I thank you all for being here. Now, tonight, they're going to explain their arts policies, their vision, and take your questions. So do make sure to put your questions into the comments bar, and we will facilitate those uh, on your behalf. Uh, now, before we begin, I do have one housekeeping note, which is that I'm at home, we're all at home, and uh, that brings its own little perils. Mine is that I have a noisy little dog. So I'm hoping that she'll be able to keep a lid on it. I can't promise it. If she does kick off, I'm going to put myself on mute, and I've asked our politicians just to be aware that they may need to continue the conversation until I can put a lid on her. But hopefully she'll stay quiet the whole time. Uh, now, it's been a hellish year and I really want to acknowledge that the anxiety, the despair and the grief around the world and back here in Aotearoa, we've been lucky that we haven't had to carry the, uh, the medical burden that so many other countries uh, have had to, but of course the economic bite uh, is here. Uh, last week, StatsNZ confirmed the country is facing its worst recession in living memory. And what we know about those who are already hurting is that in times like this, they hurt worse. So among the Māori, Pacifica, our vulnerable communities, and of course the arts. Now the irony about the arts suffering in, in tough times is, is twofold. Number one, the Ministry of Arts, Culture and Heritage figures show that the arts and creative sector adds $11 billion to GDP and generates 90 thousand jobs. So it suffers even as it creates considerable value to our country. And number two, it's used to suffering. Not because of the old adage that to create art is to suffer, but because to create art in New Zealand is to suffer. 
Over half our creative professionals have to supplement their income outside of the sector and earn a median income of $35,000 a year. Now you take out that supplementary work and it's more like $15,000 a year. So you can imagine what COVID does to that already stretched uh, fabric. 83% of respondents to a Toya Iwi survey had to cancel an event, a hui or a gathering. So, of course, it was a relief when the government announced an historic funding injection into the sector earlier this year. It was received uh, well, but rolled out unruly. In fact, one commentator called it a botched uh, process, the announcement a botched process, given its revelations came really in devilish waves. The first budget announcement came off uh, May 15. It was like a wraith smoking out from the depths, offering a little more than grim reality. Two weeks later, manna from heaven, the announcement of $95 million, pretty good, but not earth shattering. Then two days after that, $175 million uh, arts and music recovery package was announced. The heavens were alight as a veritable cascade of cash poured onto the sector's head. But we know what happens when the rain falls heavy after a drought. Perhaps the only convenient thing about Auckland's bridge breaking is that it creates the perfect analogy uh, tonight for the funding muddle that has arisen from the government giving unprecedented funds to a sector without, it seems, a robust structure to distribute it. The arts community awaits one side, the funding the other, and in the middle of the work is desperately trying to figure out uh, how to build the framework. Of course, the bridge has a blueprint. It only needs repair. Uh, the arts community and the government must invent and build from scratch. And it's telling of the historic underfunding of the sector that when it finally gets a decent, decent funding injection, it isn't properly resourced and how to spend it. So what will happen with this cash and how should it be distributed? Does this set a new benchmark for arts funding or is it just a rainy day and one off spend? Either way, where is the strategy, the long-term plan for creating a healthy ecosystem of relevant agencies from local to central government and arts organizations to the individual artist. Where is the engagement plan? Is the intent to produce a plan to the arts world or co-design uh, a strong and sustainable plan together? How do we recognize the contribution of Maori arts and ensure equitable outcomes? What's the long-term plan to ensure not just the survival of the sector, but the ongoing relevance of the sector to society? How will we measure the known well-being outcomes of arts, culture, and heritage to New Zealanders? These are some of the points that we want uh, some clarity on and some vision from our politicians tonight. So let's go to our politicians. The Greens, Chloe Swarbrick, Nationals, Jonathan Young, and Labour's Carmel Sipuluni. Uh, we're going to ask uh, each of our politicians to speak to their arts policies. We're going to give them three minutes each to do that. Uh, it's fine if you go short, of course, but if you go over that three minutes, I, I will uh, let you know. Uh, arts, culture and heritage. Arts, culture and heritage is in alphabetical order, so we're going to follow suit. Whether we go by our politicians' first or last names, the order is the same, in fact. So we're going to start with uh, Carmel Sipuluni and then Chloe Swarbrick, followed by Jonathan Young. So, Kea Kwe, Carmel, over to you. Well, kia ora, Mariama, and thank you for the opportunity to, to come on this platform. Can I also acknowledge uh, Enon and Heta for welcoming us into this space and thank Te Taumata Toya Iwi for the opportunity to participate. Uh, it is a privilege for me to represent the Labour Party uh, and also our primary spokesperson for arts, culture and heritage, Jacinda Ardern, as well as the other uh, Labour associate spokesperson of arts, culture and heritage, uh, Grant Robertson. And perhaps the fact that we have three ministers for the arts is indicative uh, of the relevance and the value that we do place on the arts sector. I really want to acknowledge all of our amazing artists, uh, our arts organisations, those pro promoting, practising, preserving our unique culture and heritage, and those who support the arts and artists. Can I also acknowledge how difficult COVID has been uh, on the arts, culture and heritage sector? It has globally impacted on the arts. A little while back, I was invited on a call with the Australian state and federal ministers to discuss the implications for the art sector of COVID. Uh, at that time, we had just come out of lockdown. We were at level one. We were finding some semblance of, a semblance of, of normality. Uh, our New Zealand Symphony Orchestra had just performed live alongside Macy Vika in Wellington uh, to a full audience. Our theatres had resumed. Things were starting to get underway. 
we discussed on that call uh, the supports in place. And I heard from uh, some of the other ministers in Australia concerns about how they were going to support and rejuvenate their art sector. Some made comments that their wage subsidy was not readily available to many artists. Uh, my reflections were that it had been devastating for our art sector as well. Uh, our wage subsidy, however, was accessed by artists and arts organisations in New Zealand. We were rolling out what was a significant arts recovery package, a package that was informed by the sector themselves. In fact, I spent many uh, hours on Zoom with different cohorts from across the art sector to ask what was needed, not just for survival, but for sustainability of the art sector moving forward. But I never went as far as to say that we had um, completely sorted which what, what was going to be a huge challenge for us as a country. Uh, our arts policy heading into this election is very much informed by what the sector have told us they need. Uh, the announcements to date uh, by the government have been COVID related, but are very much aligned with Labour's five point plan. It is about investing in people. It is about jobs, jobs, jobs in the art sector. Uh, it is about preparing for the future and less obvious, but I believe also uh, important, investing in small business uh, and also positioning ourselves globally because we know that our arts help us to do that. The funding is mostly for two years and is unashamedly focused on not only getting us through this, but making sure we are well positioned once COVID passes. The list of where we have focused our investment in the art sector is long. Uh, we've already committed this money, so there will be no U-turn from the Labour Party on this support. And I think that's important uh, to note and to also check with the other political parties that are running. Uh, I think it's also important to note that where the funding has gone or is going, um, because the list provides a clear picture of our commitment to the arts. So we have set aside funding for careers support for job seekers, a creative arts recovery and employment fund, a cultural innovation fund, a cultural capability fund, a New Zealand Human Music Recovery Fund, and a range of other things, including a screen production fund. Uh, there's investment in Matauranga Māori. For the first time, investment in Pacific... I, don't come, I, I have to stop you there, Carmel. We need to go to Chloe, Chloe Swarbrick. Chloe. I can't do one closing sentence. One closing sentence. One closing start. sentence. The government's investment is significant and signals the Labour parties and also our government partners, the Greens and New Zealand's first commitment to not only meet the immediate challenges of COVID, but ensure a thriving art sector into the future. Kapai. Kia ora. Chloe. Kia ora. Uh, and you've got to admire, um, I do admire Carmel Sipoloni in the way that she is able to string together a sentence with many a comma. Um, so kia ora tātou e te whanau. Um, my name is Chloe Swarbrick. I'm a Green Party MP, have served uh, for the past three years in this first term of our historic uh, time in government and confidence and supply with Labour and obviously with New Zealand First and Coalition. I want to join with the Minister uh, in acknowledging those that have brought tonight together, but also those who are watching. So I got involved in politics uh, actually because of the closure of my favourite music venue, uh, the King's Arms. It was as a result of poor planning regulation, you know, the kind of final nail in the coffin was a cheap apartment block was going up next door and of course an established music venue you uh, was the kind of collateral damage to that. So I was also working at Neck of the Woods on Karangahape Road and 95BFM, so also hold the broadcasting portfolio and have an immense interest in that. However, uh, I just I just want to foreshadow with these opening comments the trajectory of the kaupapa of the Green Party of Aotearoa in New Zealand. You've heard a lot and you always will, I guess one of the common buzzwords of politicians nowadays is to speak about the sustainability of sectors. And of course sustainability is incredibly important, but I think that we need to be moving uh, that mahi from the position of sustainability, which is kind of poised in equilibrium, to one of regeneration. So when we're talking about arts, culture and heritage, it's incredibly important to the Greens uh, that we move into a space that acknowledges a kind of te ao Māori, you know, in the, in the ilk of Sir Mason Jury's Te Whare Tapa Whā, focusing on our cultural identity, our sense of belonging, and therein the overlap 
with mental well-being in particular. I think here, uh, as I spoke to last night on a mental health panel, uh, that it is really important that we also have these deep uh, and sometimes quite controversial discussions about de- uh, or rather extricating the kind of inextricable links at the moment between lotteries funding and that which goes into our local communities and into our arts. I also think that perhaps in the same way with mental health, we have moved towards some cross-party work and long-term strategy, that we can perhaps do the same in the arts, culture and heritage space. Here, I think that we can perhaps learn from the mahi that the government has laid down in the Screen Sector 2030 uh, kind of pipeline and operate in that same form of partnership from an overarching strategy therein. COVID-19, as Carmel outlined, was a period of time that hit this sector incredibly hard. But I also want to say, um, with many of my friends as artists, that you know, business as usual wasn't operating all too well, particularly before that. But during COVID-19, a huge number of Kiwis turned to film, to music, to podcasts, to books, the same kinds of arts and culture that we so often bag as a waste of money and resource. And I guess that, I hope, is the kind of prompt for the rest of the corridor tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Chloe Swarbrick. Um, we're going to go now to Jonathan Young from National. Kia ora Thank you, uh, Miriama and uh, Enon and Hita. Thank you for your uh, opening remarks. You're welcome. Uh, look, thank you for the opportunity to, to participate uh, this evening. Um, you know, I'm I'm sitting in my home in uh, New Plymouth in Taranaki, and uh, I lived in Auckland for uh, probably 22 years. So I understand um, and appreciate just the the the, the breadth of um, experience of people that are uh, in uh, our great city up there. Uh, look, I think the challenges before us are, are substantial. Um, as we as we look to um, how we're going to navigate through a COVID world, uh, and I think that uh, we would be um, very mindful that that is the challenge before us. Um, I know that Creative NZ um, did a survey of the people of, of Christchurch and uh, discovered that um, seventy two percent of the inhabitants or you know of the people of Christchurch believe that arts, culture, and heritage were a very integral. Um, component to the rebuilding of the vitality of their city. And look, I think that we must have the same attitude and understanding uh, that as we as we start to bring back together the vitality of our city centres and our communities, um, that we continue to um, promote um, the arts, culture and heritage sector as, um, as a wonderful opportunity just to enhance the well-being and enhance the connectivity in our communities. Uh, and it, it simply is because uh, so much of what we do in this sector is about appreciation of other people's contributions, their creativity. Um, there's such an emotional um, opportunity for people to connect. And uh, there is, uh, you know, the aspect of celebration of who we are um, and it enhances our identity. Uh, so. Um, I'm very keen to, to not only maintain um, all the particular areas in the arts, culture and heritage uh, portfolio. Let's just give this a moment and hopefully Jonathan will uh, That are very important and need convoy lost you for a moment. It must be, um, it must be that uh, it's very difficult to get the message across Mount Messenger. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Jonathan Young. Uh, great to hear from all three of you. Thanks for setting the scene and, and outlining your vision. Um, as Kate Powell said in The Big Idea, while the most significant budget boost in a generation is to be applauded, it's what we do with the money that really counts because if it's used correctly, there is a chance to create rejuvenating change. That takes careful planning and consultation, but as always with the arts, we will need to be prepared to go off script. So. Let's go off script with our politicians now. And I'd like to start with uh, Carmel Sepuloni with the Minister. The Greens have a comprehensive art policy, arts policy already available. It's been there for quite some time. Uh, where's Labour's? Ora Mariama. Look, I think it was really clear in terms of the investments that we made at the last budget, which I think have been understated and perhaps because of what you pointed out, Mariama, that they were announced 
um, gradually. They weren't announced as an entire package, um, but it is significant. And the, the points that I pointed out earlier and some of the uh, funds that I referred to will carry us through uh, for the next two years at least and then continue that investment. And so to but build where's on your arts policy? So that's announcements. Those are some announcements that were made. They were fantastic. You yes. would think that that would um, then be followed up by a comprehensive arts policy that could be viewed Effectively, online. Effectively, Miriam, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that those are investments for the next two, three, four years. And so the money has been invested. The sector told us what they needed for the next two to three years. And so that will continue to be our focus, whether it be rolling out the partnership that the Ministry of Arts, Culture and Heritage is building with MSD to uh, create careers for job seekers and creative arts and industries, uh, whether it be the continued investment in Matauranga Māori, uh, the investment that we have finally made in our Pacifica festivals, all of that is a plan moving forward. And so in terms of uh, any additional uh, information on top of that, I think that we have strategically already thought through with the sector what the plan is and it's in front of us. When will you release that in a form that can be viewed and read? Well, well, most of the detail around what will happen over the next two or three years has been rolled out. Our manifesto will be uh, released in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but can I say that we're not creating something from scratch. What we have invested in and already committed money to is what the sector asked us for. Uh, and so this is not a government or politicians making decisions by themselves. This is actually a call from the sector. Well, that's a good point, and, and we will we will um, talk about that more later. Can I ask you, Jonathan Young, uh, Nationals Arts Policy, when will we see that? Uh, you'll probably see that in the next week or so. Um, uh, I mean, I've, I've got bits of paper here that specify some of those particular um, policy um, areas that we're going to go with. Hold them closer um, to the camera, Jono. Closer to the camera. Let us read them. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, yeah, can I... When can we say it in the next week or so, you're saying? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, can I can I say that I did actually um, ask the Minister of Arts, Culture and Heritage, you know, on a right on with Jacinda Ardern, on what sort of advice she received regarding all the allocations in the COVID Recovery Response Fund. And I tell you what, out of all of those different fundings, uh, the answer came back um, that they hadn't received any advice. And maybe that's just what was told me, um, because except that there'd been advice around the budget process from Ministry of Culture and Heritage. Um, and Are you questioning Carmel um, saying that she engaged with the sector? No, I'm not. I'm just saying that, um, that there wasn't any information given to us in terms of the depth of consultation. And I just think that that's such a uh, important thing to do. I'm, I'm very gratified to hear Carmel say that that took place. If you look at uh, my ministerial diary, you'll see multiple Zoom meetings with the art sector, particularly over lockdown as we planned this, uh, Jonathan. And I did say as the junior arts minister out of the three of us, uh, and given that out of me, Jacinda and Grant, I might have been the least busy during lockdown, I'm not saying I wasn't busy, that I would lead the consultation with the sector. And, and I did. Yeah, which is very good. Uh, because I do think that the, the that the co-design element is quite critical. Um, yeah. Certainly, and certainly we uh, would be totally committed to that process, not just in terms of the uh, of the response recovery fund that was being established, but going forward, because I do think there's an opportunity to do a reset um, in terms of where does our creative sector uh, see the opportunity is going awesome. forward for our for our nation um, because I'm sure there's burgeoning ideas that uh, that you, you want to uh, communicate back. So let me ask you this, Jonathan Young. You're very active in your energy portfolio. Um, you know, I was looking at your Facebook to see what kind of um, posts you've done around arts and the arts sector. The last one was April 26, when you suggested the government needs to urgently develop a, a support package for New Zealand's uh, live events and creative arts sector. Uh, April 26, the government did do that. I haven't seen anything since then. I've seen a lot of stuff around your en energy portfolio, but not much uh, out there around your interest in the arts. Can I ask you how important the sector is to you? Oh, well, actually, it's um, it's incredibly important. I I, I love the sector. Um, I feel that I'm uh, somebody who can bring a lot of support 
and um, energy to it. Um, yeah, it's 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 probably fair to say that in our energy sector, um, and particularly in our region of Taranaki, it's a particularly important um, area locally. But I have um, perhaps, as Carmel has during lockdown, had a lot of connection with the arts, culture, and heritage sector as well. Um, I probably haven't posted all of those sorts of meetings and engagements on Facebook, um, as likewise, I probably don't do that with the meetings that I have with the energy sector as well. Um, but, so so anyway, tell, well, tell me what you made of, of the government's uh, funding support package for, for the arts this year. Oh, look, I think, um, I think it left a lot of people um, wondering whether something was coming or not. Um, and it came out in a number of tranches. Uh, and I've, I've heard some people say that they felt it could have been um, better directed. Um, but however, that's always going to happen. People will say that, and that's no criticism of the government. I think the package they have put together um, is good and substantial, and we will continue to support it if we're in government. Um, and I do think there is an opportunity through that, uh, not just to respond and to recover, but to think, okay, how can we use this, this kind of once in a lifetime opportunity to, um, to kind of reimagine what the sector can do? Um, and look, there's lots of challenges there. And, uh, and, and Carmel is as well aware of those. And, um, and I think that this is a, I think a portfolio that I think the comments be made where there could actually be quite, quite solid cross party support. Um, and I'm certainly prepared to give credit where it's due. That's good to hear because we will talk about that too. I just wanted to just double check with you. So, so Carmel uh, said that we know you turn on this funding uh, going forward of the support. So you're saying that should national take power, there will be no change to this funding uh, level? Yeah, essentially that's correct. Okay, good to hear. Um, Chloe, Swarbrick, so the money is there, you know, it's to be, to be applauded. People are very happy about the level of the money. What is lacking, what the sector is asking for is a vision and a plan for rejuvenation, for engagement. Um, what's the priority in your view for, for that funding? So the priority, uh, so I mean, there's, there's a number of different things to unpack therein. The first thing to note is that, of course, the Greens were in support of and helped to bring forward the support for that package, which the Minister acknowledged. So this was of critical importance to us as well. And um, whilst Jono um, is based in Taranaki, um, and there is a focus there on uh, the energy space, there also are some fantastic local artists there, and I know that he has acknowledged them in the past. So um, I think that, you know, moving forward, we need to make sure that this funding isn't just something that drops off the face of the earth come two years down the track. And to ensure that that doesn't happen and that we actually end up with whatever oscillation of government occurs in future times, that strategy and that cross-party work that was just alluded to that I um, spoke to in my opening statements and Jonathan backed up just now, I think offers um, a fantastic platform to move forward and to build what I said should be not just a sustainable sector, but one that is ongoing and regenerative unto itself. So I actually think that the best pathway forward is right here tonight. Uh, we get all of the political parties who seem to have indicated that at a baseline there is support for what's currently occurred to agree to, at a baseline, the kaupapa of cross-party work to establish a strategy in the same way that we have seen strategies established for the screen sector, that 2030 uh, 10-year plan is fantastic. And from my understanding and from the discussions that I've had with those who operate in that sector, had huge amounts of buy-in with all of those from techies through to actors through to production. So we have the opportunity to do the same with an overarching arts and culture strategy. And on that, just in summation, I note that tonight, obviously, we're talking primarily about Tamaki Makoto, uh, but I want to make sure that we don't neglect the regions um, in this, because, you know, I was uh, down in Invercargill probably last year, and I found there that as a result of um, Invercargill Library losing its, uh, sorry, Invercargill Art Gallery losing its local space, uh, and the local government not having the resources to fund the procurement of a new space, they've effectively moved into a little closet in Invercargill Library. 
and the kind of focus that they see on Tamaki Makoto from Wellington, from the beehive, kind of does understandably make them somewhat angry. So I think that we need to make sure that kids in this country, that adults, that all people in this country, regardless of wherever they are growing up or wherever they live, have the opportunity to engage with our arts and culture. Okay, let, let's go into a little bit more then with Carmel Sepuloni. So strong sentiment from the, from the arts sector that a, a cross-ministerial approach um, would be useful, one that takes into account the arts influence across a number of different sectors, industry, education, health, for example. Um, I presume you support this notion. And if you do, what does that look like to you? How will you roll that out? I absolutely support that, Miriamma, and we're already seeing some of it when, um, I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm the Minister for Social Development, Minister for Disability Issues, Associate Minister for Pacific, uh, and then, of course, uh, more recently, ACC, but, of course, Arts, Culture and Heritage Associate as well. Uh, and it, it should never be underestimated, the overlap, the way those portfolios complement each other, uh, and it's been interesting for me to even work between that MSD and arts, culture and heritage space, uh, encouraging MSD to think beyond the uh, traditional jobs that um, they encourage people on benefit to go into, uh, to create the opportunity for, opportuni uh, for, for people to pathway into jobs in the creative arts and industries. We've seen it already in the last couple of years with when they have their uh, employment expos for those on benefit, they are thinking outside the square and we do see the creative arts and industries in there promoting uh, jobs that are in the sector. And so we see some of that. We also see- So how do, we, how do we do this then, uh, Minister? How do we get that uh, cooperation going? The cooperation is already happening. I think it's um, going to be even more fast paced now because of the environment that we're in. Um, but the point that was made, I think, you know, by um, the organisers of this event, that we lack some of the, the research that we need um, that clearly demonstrates the benefits of, uh, of the arts, culture and heritage sector to health and well-being is very clear. Implicitly, we all know it, um, but the research perhaps isn't there. Uh, and some of that needs to happen. I've commissioned some work around creative spaces, and it's very clear the impact that that has on mental well-being. Uh, and it's clear on the ability for that to be a platform for people to have access to employment and just participation in their communities. Uh, so there is more to do, but the work is underway. It was underway pre-COVID, I have to say, Miriamma, but COVID has presented us with an opportunity uh, to, to do, make further progress in this area. Jonathan Young, your, your thoughts, what would you do? Oh, look, I think, um, I think what COVID has done, um, like it does, right across um, all the countries of the world, it brings to light underlying issues, whether they are uh, health, medical, or whether they're economic. Um, and so what this pressured point of time has done is um, expose vulner vulnerabilities. Look, I think the opportunity exists for the arts, culture, and heritage sector to be very, very much centre uh, to the economic recovery around particularly our hospitality and accommodation sectors, around the revitalization of our city centres, of getting people um, not just back to normal, but actually engaging in, um, I think, experiences that are, are really vital to um, what it is to, to celebrate being a, a human. Um, and I think that uh, a lockdown, no matter how long it is for us, you know, it was a matter of less than, less than two months. Um, it certainly has brought out the appreciation of the things that we can do that um, give us enjoyment. So again, um, so again, look, think, you're, you're talking about really lovely ideas and, and what we need to do is what I'm asking you. How will you put, um, how will you get a, a cross sector or cross ministerial approach going? And, and is that something you even consider important? Uh, look, yeah, I, th I think I think the opportunity is there. Um, and look, for example, what's happening in our city, and I'm sure happening around cities and, and towns around the country, is that the arts and cultural sector are putting together numbers of events that will um, kind of get people back out and back engaging. Uh, and look, and there's opportunity for government to come behind and support that. And certainly, I think from the package that the government have put together, there can be some funding opportunities around that sort of activity. Uh, look, 
you know, you look at um, our copyright laws, if we want to enable our uh, creative sector to export um, and to protect their IP, um, order, in order for it to be strong enough that it actually um, welcomes and invites investments so that people don't think that what they invest money into is going to be uh, somehow undermined by, uh, you know, people illegally copying things and distributing them um, is important as well. Um, you know, we are, we are becoming quite well known and famous for some of our um, exports around, the, you know, the digital um, arts, culture and heritage issues that we have. Um, so look, I think there's a lot of opportunity and I think that we've got to see this as a, as a huge contributor to um, not just national well-being, but also national GDP. Um, and, you know, so sometimes you have to kind of talk that language to get the economic uh, thinking people engaged in the opportunities that exist as well. Sorry, you have, you have to talk what language? You have to talk in economic speak. You have to talk about you have to talk about GDP as well as talking about well-being of. Cool. Okay. So Chloe Swarbrick, I mean, let me ask you I mean, about. You, you, you started about off by. Sorry, Jonathan. I, I do want to move on to to, to Chloe Swarbrick. Right. You raised GDP in it and. I would like to ask uh, Chloe about that. Eleven billion dollars to GDP, ninety thousand jobs uh, generated from the sector. Why do you think the sector isn't uh, valued for its economic contribution? Well, um, if I can just be completely straight up and blunt, I think it's that oftentimes it's because people who attempt to justify things in so-called economic speak are sometimes rather disingenuous in doing so. Even the very notion of GDP, gross domestic product, it was originally known as gross national product, invented by this guy called Simon Kuznets in the 1930s, took it to US Congress, was like, hey, Here's a really good way to measure economic transactions, but God forbid, do not use this as a measure of the welfare, what we now call well-being of our people. Because GDP does not distinguish between the quality of transactions nor the distribution of them. GDP goes up when somebody gets cancer, when somebody's in a car crash, when there's an oil spill, when there's a natural disaster, because there has to be economic transactions in order to undo that social ill. So actually, I really push back on the notion that we need to talk about it from a GDP or kind of economic perspective, because I also have made it a real mission of mine, this uh, kind of election cycle, to push back too whenever politicians invoke the notion of the economy, because I really ask that whenever a politician talks about the economy, they have it incumbent on them to define what they see as the economy. The economy by, de by definition is very literally the allocation of our resources and what we value. So for me, the question is actually about what it is that we're trying to achieve through the social contract. And, you know, there's a number of different economic theories that you can apply to that, sure, in terms of the resources that we deploy, the things that we value, and how we choose to prioritize them to improve people's outcomes in life. And on that point, you know, I think that there is a massive correlation to particularly mental well-being. And I touched earlier on the fact that we have a big problem with regard to the kind of inextricable link at present between lotteries funding um, or lottery takes and particularly pokey machines in our um, communities that are typically the most impoverished and how they end up relying on that for local community or creative funding. So on this, um, Miriama, I would say that Actually, if we want to start meaningfully talking about things like mental well-being and communities being forged and bonded together and who we are as a country in terms of our identity, then arts and culture is at the very is at the center of that. So it's about focusing on arts and culture for the sake of arts and culture. Because if we justify this from an economic frame, then as soon as it becomes unaffordable or less economically um, interesting because there's some new technological development or perhaps we can replace actors with AI, then all of a sudden you can drop kick it. So the Greens are very much focused on people and on our planet as well. So I want to pick up on one of the points that Chloe Swarbrick made, um, Carmel Sepoloni, which is the lotteries uh, gambling um, revenues that uh, that our arts are heavily reliant on. Creative New Zealand's funding, I believe, is 67% from uh, lotteries. Uh, do we look to separate that out and come up with a new funding model? 
look, you know, we've had conversations around the table about this, and it is certainly a longer term conversation that should be had. Uh, but we're not in a place to shift from that right now. Uh, and I'm not going to pretend we are. I think the point that Chloe and Jonathan both picked up on and had, a, had differing views on, I just want to make um, the, I guess it's a very clear differential between us as political parties. You know, Jonathan went down the economic value track. Um, Chloe wants to go down entirely the well-being track. Uh, and we're about both, actually. <laughs> I think a lot of artists, a lot of the artists and the art sector um, want their worth to be seen in, in terms of well-being, but also the worth and the value that they bring to this country. And so, you know, I see that with Māori and Pacific artists. It's, we're not just out there dancing for the sake of dancing, uh, actually. There are well-being value, there's well-being value, um, identity value for our children that are growing up and stalling in them who they are has a huge impact on um, their trajectory moving forward. Um, so then, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I do, I do need to pick you up on this because you're talking beautifully about the wellbeing impacts of this sector. Uh, at the same time, you're saying there doesn't appear to be any other way of addressing the fact that so much of the funding comes from um, a space that is not about wellbeing, which is lotteries. Not right um, now, Mariama, but it is a conversation that needs to be had and there needs to be thought put into that moving forward. So I won't uh, deny that the point that Chloe is making is a good point, um, but I won't pretend that we're in a position to shift from where we currently are at the moment. What, what needs to happen to make that shift? Oh, look, a lot of thinking. If I had the answers, then potentially we'd make the shift. Um, Mariana, okay. but it, it is certainly yeah, conversations about how we do this better. J Jonathan Young, what, what do you want to say about that? Yeah, oh, look, um, just a comment um, Carmel made that I was just hitting down the kind of the economic route. No, I'm not. Um, I do see that as a, um, I do see that as an important element because um, in any budget that's put forward of support and investment from the government, um, you've got to compete against other sectors as well who, who want that support and investment. Um, so being able to say that, okay, if it's well-being, if it's people actually, um, you know, having a better quality of life, a more healthy quality of life, okay, that's a good thing. That's substantial. That is worth entering into the debate and the contest around that. Um, and I think as, as we continue to see evidence of communities being positively affected by um, culture and heritage and the arts and the creative sector, as we do continue to see more and more jobs, a wonderful thing. Um, but we've got to balance the books at the same stage. We can't keep printing money forever. Um, look, coming back to the issue around um, the lottery funding, um, look, when it comes to pokies, look, I, I see that as a particular issue because there's a, there's a very strong addictive power that they have. Um, probably not as um, when I look at somebody going in on a Saturday and buying a lottery ticket um, and the funding from the, the profit the government gets out of all of that goes into the arts culture and the sports heritage and the community trusts and organisations. Um, so I think that we've got to be quite um, like quite focused on, on being aware and cautious of those particular activities that actually create harm. Um, and, you know, I, I, I kind of agree with Carmel on the situation that we've got to start uh, posturing in the, our, our communities and society um, away from dependence on that. It's a, it's a tragic thing, actually, uh, when you have um, organisations that seek to do good in our community having to have that reliance. So you, you, you agree that we do need to extricate the arts from that funding model? Well, I think, I think from funding models that actually create harm. I don't think, I think it's inconsistent. And, you know, people might say, well, you've got to take a pragmatic view. Um, and look, all of those become debates, as um, Kamala said, around the table, um, around that. So, um, oh, look, I, I, I just agree with her sentiment. Okay, but okay. both of you have said we need, we need to do this. Any thoughts about how soon something like this can be um, achieved? Any well, it's goals? Going to, it's going to require replacement for that funding. Um, and yeah. that is then going to require actually us being a, a stronger, more productive, um, wealthier country um, in a sense, you know? And so all of those things um, have to be taken into consideration. 
Okay, well, let me come to Chloe Swarbrick then. The Greens want to provide incentives for non-arts-based businesses to invest um, in uh, the arts so the sector can move away from these, these um, funding streams. What, what would that look like? So our policy line is to provide for these donations to non-profit, that's the important element of that, to non-profit art and creative organisations, making them tax deductible like charities are. But Miriama, I just really feel as though I need to also respond to um, the kind of stipulations that it's somehow really difficult or impossible to um, disaggregate the kind of funding that we receive as a government from uh, people gambling and the perverse incentive that that creates to actually up the number of pokies, for example. And this is simply a matter of political willpower. I'd actually also say that having been around the table on a very, actually not all too dissimilar issue of the cannabis referendum and dealing with treasury and trying to ring fence funding that was immediately put into harm reduction from the sale and supply of that substance, how much pushback there actually was for ring fencing. So the very notion right now that we have ring fenced funding that comes from uh, lotteries going into arts and culture speaks to an anomaly inside of our funding system at present. So the fact that we are upholding it is a perversity and it actually could disappear relatively overnight if there was the political willpower. I don't disagree with the fact that that funding would have to come from elsewhere, but again, all of the funding at present from those pokey machines, from that gambling, would otherwise just simply go into the pot. Creating that disaggregation would mean that we no longer have that overt reliance on increased gambling to increase uh, funding for our arts and cultural sector. So yeah, one of the many ways that we could go about increasing the funding would be through um, greater incentivization of that kind of philanthropic funding, but that is just one part of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle, I think, is really that long-term strategy piece that we were speaking to before. Um, there is a lot of kind of lip service to the idea of working in partnership or otherwise, and I actually think that our government's done an incredible job, as I keep referring to, because it's a great piece of work. The Screen Sector 2030 strategy is an example, a tangible, concrete example of how we can apply this across Aotearoa, across the arts and cultural space. I just want to give um, Jonathan and Carmel the opportunity to respond to your challenge that it's a matter of political will. And the other thing that I'll just throw on there too is that with COVID closing everything down, uh, the ability for people to spend money uh, on pokies and 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 uh, other lottery uh, and gambling um, streams is is reduced. So therefore, we can only assume that the the income that comes in to the arts will be reduced as well. But your response, uh, Carmel Sepoloni, to to uh, Chloe Swarbrick's um, challenge that this is really a matter of political will. Uh, you know, as I said earlier. Um, conversations have been had and it's something to look at moving forward but we don't have the answers to that at this stage and even sitting around the table with um, New Zealand First and Green colleagues the, the, the answers haven't really been put on the table um, and you know philanthropic funding I have to say um, is, is a great idea uh, but even our social services our proven social services who have um, you know, to some extent relied on philanthropic funding uh, for a number of years are seeing that dry up because of what we're going through currently. Uh, and so, you know, I think we need to be realistic to a certain extent about the context that we're in. I'm not saying that that conversation about lotteries uh, shouldn't be had. I'm just saying that it won't happen just yet in terms of the change. I'm not going to go into the election uh, saying that that's something that we're going to be able to turn around. Jonathan Young? Yeah, look, I think that's a um, that's a, a pretty clear position that Carmel's outlined there, which I think is quite pragmatic. Um, I do think that we have to be a bit more discerning about when we talk about um, lotteries and when we talk about pokies um, versus some of the other um, elements of, of gaming, I guess. Um, because it all comes down to the fact, and I think that's the case, um, where, where revenues available to support um, this sector and invest into it um, are being constrained. So, okay, there's a, there's a large recovery fund that's been established and everybody talks about, you know, let's hope that can continue on in the future, but that's going to be dependent on us actually having a revitalized and, and rejuvenated economy. Um, like I said before, we can't keep, um, you know, creating money out of fresh air. Um, so there's some real challenges in the economy. And I think um, Carmel certainly has 
um, noted that. Um, and I do think that in terms of what Chloe was saying about I'd love to respond if Jonathan's not going to come back. Political will. I think there's plenty of political yes. will, but our, um, you know, I just think I think it's it's very very challenging. Um, and I think that um, if we found the answers very simply, well, heck, you know, would be would be very very happy. But I think they're quite challenging. Oh, I, I just, just want to make say... it really clear. Can I just make it really clear that what we're talking about here is disaggregating what is a very unusual tether between revenue that is raised from lotteries funding and what goes into arts and culture. That is a very unusual way of funding and kind of ring fencing the revenue that the government raises. To give you an example of just how weird that is, it's the equivalent of us saying, for example, that we are going to ring fence the funding from the sale of apples and we are then going to put that into the arts and culture or into some other sector. It is an anomaly inside of our system, and it is something that we are currently complicit in by choosing not to act on disaggregating it. Removing that tether does not mean that we all of a sudden get rid of lotteries funding into the broader pool that Treasury uh, facilitates. What it simply means is that there's no longer a line-by-line -line analysis that says, this money from lotteries goes directly to Creative New Zealand. What it would say is Creative New Zealand gets this much and the money from lotteries goes into that broader pool. The money comes out of that for Creative New Zealand. Can I just, can I just say, um, Chloe, I think it's admirable that you've raised this and it is an issue that we need to talk about moving forward. But in this COVID context, I don't know if this is front of mind for our artists and arts organisations as they're looking to survive through this period, put food on the table for their families, practice what they are passionate about and what they live for. I don't know if the lottery's funding is the front of mind issue for those artists and arts organisations right now. Uh, but as I said, it is a conversation that we need to have moving forward. It's and a, I've never um, said that it was the top thing either, just to be clear. Um, I, I'm, I've been incredibly clear the whole way through that a strategy, a long-term vision, and everybody being around the table, again, to the concrete examples that I've been providing earlier are critically important. We're, we're going to go dug down this it, rabbit hole. <laughs> we're going to go I, to, I, so, sorry, Jonathan, we, we, because we are running short on time, we are going to go to some questions from um, the community very soon, and, and maybe they'll have their own thoughts about how important that uh, lotteries funding is or how top of mind it is. It is certainly an issue of concern for the sector. We know that much. I want to, before we go to these questions from, um, from the community, from the sector, to talk about um, Māori dim and toy Māori. So there was criticism, for example, after the first leaders debate, there was there was not virtually no mention of of, um, of Māori dim whatsoever. So how will your let's start with you, Jonathan Young? How will your uh, arts policy uh, benefit toy Māori? Uh, look, it will it will put it at the very centre of our arts policy. It's it's incredibly important. Um, not just because of the uniqueness of um, of Maoridium, um in our country and in the world, but essentially because um, it is a um, very powerful form of expression that ought to be more and more acknowledged, celebrated, liberated. Um, and I think that um, it does give us an international point of difference, um, but it's very, I think it's very, we, we ought to be incredibly sensitive and careful about how this is, um, I guess, acknowledged and celebrated and released um, in our country and particularly internationally. Okay, and so what, what will you do? What is your specific um, action plan to, to benefit ta Toi Māori? Oh, look, we will, have, um, we will continue to have uh, funding streams uh, that are there, but we'll also ensure that uh, um, that the the the, the Cox front as well, um, and um, I think that uh, it's important for that acknowledgement around um, the I guess the the uh, treaty issues and and the partnership around all of that as well to ensure that uh, there is adequacy of support and investment. 
I don't hear any specific plan here. Okay, well, I'm sorry, you probably just need to... Possibly part of the problem is that we uh, haven't got a great... Um, uh, we're getting a bit of disturbance in, in our... To give you further. Sorry, Jonathan. Um, can you sorry. say that again? I think we've got you back again. Um, we keep losing you, so apologies to everybody for that. Um, clearly out of everybody's control. Um, but what, what specific action is National going to take to ensure that to ensure the health of, of, of Tui Māori? Well, I, I think it's incredibly important that we continue to put um, it as very much uh, centre of our um, arts, culture and heritage policy um, and uh, not necessarily diluting other elements of it, but it's got to be something which we see as inc increasingly important, I think Jonathan Young was going to say. I'm sorry to cut you off there, Jonathan, but we will move on because we do keep uh, losing you. Um, Tommy Swarbrick, can, can we, can we, yeah, apologies, Jonathan, we, we are losing you um, quite regularly now, but um, we will try and make space for, um, for you as those um, issues arise. But let's move on to Chloe Swarbrick. Um, we know that funding equity is an issue. You know, we've heard that there's systemic racism um, inside of the way that funds are distributed. Um, how do we address this? How do we address funding inequities and ensure the health of the, of the Māori um, arts sector? Uh, well, I think the starting point would be to legitimately honour Te Tiriti O Waitangi um, and short of completely reforming the way that our parliament operates from an inherently uh, colonial Westminster uh, way, uh, I think that in the arts and cultural space as a pragmatic measure and something that we can implement almost immediately, uh, I mean, the, the best case scenario would be not just kind of platitudes around placing Māori dim at the centre, but then talking about funding streams as though it's kind of a nice to have or something that would kind of be part of this bigger thing. Um, it would be half of what we're looking at and what we're talking about. So if we're talking about producing this kind of long-term strategy and where we address these inequities, then there needs to be a tikanga-based, a te ao Māori-based strategy, a long-term strategy moving forward, and the revenue tied to that and the commitments that come out of government, but I would hope as well out of a cross-party group, which it appears as though we have um, some interest in tonight, uh, means that that happens moving forward. And therein, I think we also have an opportunity to uh, not only in our schools through the implementation of things like New Zealand history, but also through the media that we produce, the arts and culture that we produce, through the film that we produce, through the books that we produce, uh, through the public art that we produce, that we have a greater opportunity to understand the land that we stand on. Carmel Sipoloni, your, your views? Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, I agree with Chloe and, and what Chloe was saying about tikanga, it's about how we practice in Parliament as well. Uh, we made it very clear, as I said, that when we were forming the recovery package, we needed to consult to, with all those that were effective, uh, affected. Uh, and that saw funding go to Matatini, that saw funding go to a Matauranga Māori fund, that saw uh, funding go to uh, places like the Waitangi Trust Board because there was a need and there was a vision moving forward. Um, I've been the, the minister that's done that consultation, but I've got around 13 Māori Labour colleagues who I connect with and consult with too when we make these decisions, and that's really important. But there are other funds uh, as well, whether it be Creative New Zealand, whether it be the film uh, screen industry funding where um, we have to be deliberate and we have to make sure that there is ring fenced funding and all of those funding that are targeted uh, funds that are targeted towards uh, Māori, uh, making sure that Māori have equal access to the opportunities that those funds create. There was an interesting uh, suggestion made um, to me that, you know, we have a science advisor. What about an arts advisor, Carmel? Oh, we've had this conversation before, actually. We never quite landed there, but it became more prominent um, during the lockdown. Uh, we, we did talk about this, and I think it is something to consider uh, moving forward for sure. Um, and I was quite interested in that idea. Let's go to some of the questions that have been coming in from the sector now. Uh, so the first one is, we all know the arts is broad and far reaching. What is one transformational shift candidates can advocate for in the arts? Jonathan Young. 
Um, look, I would like to see um, a program put in place um, and it will be part of our policy about getting senior high school students into opportunities where they can uh, start to be aware of the breadth of opportunity there exists in a creative career. Um, a few years ago when I sat down and talked, um, I had instituted and run a uh, similar program uh, here in my city of New Plymouth for senior students around um, careers. Um, but I think we need to do that for creative careers. What they found out um, in their own research that the creative sector in terms of employment, now this is all pre-COVID, so, so it might have changed, but the creative sector in terms of employment was three times faster than the ordinary economy. And I think there's some huge opportunities for young people in particular. I'd like to see that opened up. This is, um, I think, we missed what you said, but I think this is your creative accelerator uh, yeah. Yeah. suggestion that you were making. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, Chloe Swarbrick, I'll ask you the same question. What's one transformational shift candidates can advocate for in the arts? Uh, transformational means radically changing the way that we currently approach things. So I think it's the uh, same thread that I've kind of been advocating for this whole way through this debate so far. It is that long-term strategy, but more than just uh, kind of being a review, because we've seen a number of reviews, not just from this government, but from past governments, you know, I'll use uh, for sake of a less controversial example um, than others that are presently on the table, the likes of the reviews on uh, MMP and on things like lowering the threshold. Those things sit on the shelves despite being recommended by the experts. So producing something that isn't only a review of the sector, but is very literally a strategy that has buy-in from everybody as much as is possible. Um, I know that that is sometimes a difficult thing coming from the Greens where everything is consensus based, uh, but as much buy-in as is possible. And then that there is actually a commitment so based on, you know, my uh, limited, but uh, a whole lot more than I had three years ago, experience inside parliaments and the kind of vote structure of our budgets, there is actually the opportunity here to create a long-term strategy and the deployment of funding for a longer period of time than, for example, you know, we typically do on a year-on-year -year basis. And we've seen this, for example, in the mental health space with the PICI pilot, which has uh, a dedicated funding for three to four years or so. So we can do the same thing with a long-term strategy, five to 10 years or even 20 years thereafter, but I think it would be really meaningful to have constant review and iterations and the framework that we build around that in parliaments as that cross-party group. That would be fundamentally transformational in this space. And Carmel. Uh, I, I've never thought that transformation can come about from one action, so it might take a little bit of time. I will say too, um, working with the arts sector, uh, even trying to pull together just a strategy for Pacific Arts Festivals across the country um, was challenging. We got there, but an overarching one for the whole sector um, is, is would be very challenging, yeah. I think, given the difference across the arts. But what I will say is if I had to choose a couple of things or, or that can be encapsulated in one that I think is transformational. It's the investment in um, careers in the arts, letting our, our communities know that actually there is a pathway to working in the arts. There are wonderful role models who have done it. Um, we've announced already that we will um, heavily extend the Creatives in Schools program as part of that, not only providing jobs for the artists, but also allowing them to have access to our young people so they can inspire them uh, to be part of the art sector as well. And on top of that, as I said, you know, that that new lens on what careers places like the Ministry for Social Development focus on working with people to get into and reinstating things like PACE. So actually letting our people know that they can have a livable career in the arts and live their passion. Uh, and whilst doing that, inspire others to do the same thing, I think is, is very important. Thanks for that. Um, Jonathan Young, in what ways does your party support a STEAM rather than STEM approach to education? Uh, look, I think um, it's, it's really important because uh, we know that the creative sector <clears throat> um, is not just in the classical, what you'd consider to be um, fine arts, performing arts, um, but creativity is right through our industries. Um, you know, it could be architecture, 
graphic design, a whole bunch of other areas. So look, I think we, we need to have a science, technology, engineering, arts, uh, mathematics kind of view of life um, because, because we all contribute um, in different ways to, um, to actually engage and grow our economy. So I'm, I'm really for that. Okay. Chloe Swarbrick, how are you going to create greater sustainability and opportunities for artists and small arts organisations in Aotearoa? So I think that's probably, um, th there's two ways that we can go about doing that, one of which is changing the way that we do procurement, um, and that probably also involves greater consultation and involvement with local government. Um, I'm a hippie green, so I see everything as interconnected, uh, but I am very staunchly of the view that the mahi that we did um, in kind of the first year or so, um, it was just one small thing, but it was undoing the change that the National Party did and removing from the Local Government Act the focus on the four well-beings so that local government could once again justify not purely from a short-term balancing of the books kind of rationale, uh, the investment in things like public artworks. Um, on top of that, you know, in the local government space in particular, um, it's kind of where I got my start in politics and came to learn a whole lot about how we can interact with our communities and create structures for um, better investment. So there is a massive issue in the way that local government operates and has done for the past several decades, whereby politicians and central government are able to wag the finger at a growing mandate of issues on the table for local uh, government politicians and councillors and mayors and say, you haven't done this, but no, we're not going to change the way that you're resourced. So the only way that they have to increase their resourcing is through increasing rates. And I've been lobbying and working with Anaya Mahuta as the Minister for Local Government on this as well. Um, the flip side of procurement is also about potentially releasing uh, smaller amounts of funding, which are particularly focused on following artists throughout their careers. Um, right now, at least what I'm hearing is that there are some challenges with folks who don't necessarily have a name or a reputation or relationships with those who are already established. Um, so, you know, I was speaking to artists um, and art students at University of Canterbury yesterday who were saying that there's a real challenge in getting money in the door for the establishment of some contemporary art galleries down that way. And that's, you know, not even touching the sides on the issues around the rebuild. But they were saying one of the best ways that they can go about actually ensuring that there's a thriving opportunity and potential being realized in Canterbury so that students don't need to move to Auckland or overseas to Melbourne or Berlin or London, obviously in a post-COVID world or pre-COVID, uh, is to make sure that there is that funding available locally. And here I think local government is a key part of the solution. But also, and I'll keep banging on about it because it's bloody important, that long-term strategy, because as soon as we have government, um, not just this government, but future iterations of government through that cross-party work committing to it, it'll bloody get done. It'll bloody get done, says Chloe Swarbrick, Carmel Sepuloni. Your response. Oh, sorry, did you want me to answer the same question? I, want, I would like your response to, to Chloe Swarbrick's um, suggestion that with the right will, things can be done. Oh, absolutely. And I think we've seen that already um, with what we've managed to achieve um, with the investment in the arts during COVID. I think, you know, as I said, it's, it's gone undetected how much has been invested in this space and how much our arts community have been part of the discussions around actually creating these funds. When so you, yes, so, so let, me, let me just ask you about that. How do you engage with the arts sector? Because there would be a fair few who'd, who would say that that has not been effective. Well, I live with an artist, that helps, that's one. Um, that's not my husband is Sam one moment, by the way. Um, and, you know, I'm fully engaged with um, the, the, the Pacific Arts community. That's one of the reasons that I took that on. But I've also had the Creative New Zealand, the, Mata, the Matauranga Māori, the, the ballet, the symphony orchestra and um, the Film Commission and Music Commission um, parts of the portfolio. And so it's not just meeting with the organisations. There's so many people invested in those institutions and those organisations who want to meet to let you know what their views are on things. And we have done that over the last three years. Uh, now, you feel that you have effectively in, engaged. Look, I do, yeah. I do want to move on from there, uh, just because we are running short on time. Um, but I want to stay with you for a moment, Carmel. 
how can right. government support COVID safe policies and venues that would see audience sizes increase safely? Is there any capacity for a type of insurance that would guarantee companies a payout of levels move up when shows are planned so contractors could be paid out for bookings? It's so that's two, let's, let's divide that up. Let's go with the first bit. How can government support COVID safe policies and venues that would see audience sizes increase safely? Um, well, I think the indemnity issue has been raised. It's an issue that I know that uh, has been canvassed with the other Associate Minister of Arts, Culture and Heritage, which is appropriately also the Finance Minister, uh, Minister Robertson. And I don't think any decisions have been made on what that might look like. I will say a lot of our artists have um, successfully um, moved towards digital platforms and are being innovative about how they will um, undertake their arts um, during this COVID period, knowing that in some ways we do have to be innovative and think about how we do things differently. Uh, we saw a lot of that during lockdown um, and I certainly enjoyed it. I'm sure many of the others on this panel discussion tonight did too, um, but it is time to rethink also uh, how we share our arts and so many artists have been very successful about rethinking that to date. Let me ask the second part of that question to Jonathan Young. Is there any capacity for a type of insurance that would guarantee companies a payout and levels move up and when shows are planned, then they have to be cancelled uh, so that contractors, so that artists can be paid? Well, I, you know, it's a, um, it's, qu it's quite a difficult question because, you know, you'd, you'd want to find a, an insurer who would be competent enough to back that. And if not, then um, if the sector felt that that was something got value and needed, then you'd want a government to be an underwriter as well. And I look, I think that is, is quite challenging because um, there's other broader sectors, um, other sectors in the economy that close down. Would you say that to a restaurant owner that we're gonna give you an insurance cover um, for all of that? So you're kind of opening up a big, big question. Um, and I think, probably I think for the event sector, what they want to know is if we can bring in um, rugby teams and Crankworks is on the list of being able to bring in people, um, how can they bring in international artists? Um, and do we have a stringent enough um, border system and a contact tracing or you know, track and tracing system where people can actually be confident um, to actually plan these events, um, you know, and a, 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 I guess a health surveillance system that gives the confidence for people to be able to plan the events and run them. And look, all of that is, um, I guess, must, most of it um, is dependent on what is happening in the country. And it seems to be, if you look around the world, um, uh, resurgences are happening in different places. We've had our resurgence in a sense that's a lot smaller than it's happening in the UK at the moment in different places. Uh, it's a it's a big, big question that I think is very difficult to find a finite, easy answer to. Uh, any thoughts, Chloe Swarbrick? I think it's worth investigating, but I don't think that it's a simple solution either. Um, and I do definitely agree that, you know, ultimately, you know, what we're operating in, as everybody keeps saying, is unprecedented times. That's and it. we could end up as a result of research and development that's happening locally and overseas with the vaccine quite quickly, or it could take quite a while. Um, and there's a number of variables that, you know, are quite difficult to predict. So, um, yeah, it's not a simple solution worth investigating. But on this, I want to talk the mahi of particularly Save Our Venues, um, operating mostly out of Taumaki Makoto, uh, and the work that they have been doing to raise the profile of particularly our music venues, small and larger. Let's, let's stay with you for a moment, Chloe Swarbrick. So what evidence and engagement from the sector would you use to inform how the Ministry for Culture and Heritage and Creative New Zealand deploy their funds? I'm going to go back to the strategy <laughs> I've been banging on about constantly because I don't think there is presently a perfect way to do this. And we know that the size of the Ministry for Arts, Culture and Heritage, I believe it's like off the top of my head around 22 people. Um, it, it's not massive. Um, and it also, as you've kind of highlighted in earlier questions, Mariama is requiring of that cross-sectoral, cross-ministerial um, mahi. 
and therein um, I also, you know, as um, one of Carmel's colleagues as well, Chris Hipkins, who's also the Minister of State Services, um, I've been lobbying quite a bit in the Ministry of Education space and local government and also in MCH to move towards some changes in how those administrative systems operate. So I don't think that at present there is a perfect way of engaging, but I think that through the process of a tikanga te ao Māori approach to long-term strategy development, again, as we've seen in other sectors, is the best way to go about developing that to begin with. Thank you for that. Uh, this is a question to you all. What role do, um, do you all believe arts and culture play in the national identity of Aotearoa, and how can they ensure that investment will be robust and connected into the widest reaches of the country to ensure that investment in the people? Now, we have we have touched on this, but for people who have come in uh, a bit later, this is a good opportunity to revisit some of the hoarded or that we've had uh, already. So let's start with you, Carmel Sipoloni. It's massive, Mariama. Um, you know, as a Pacific person, and um, I think we share this with Māori, access to arts, culture and heritage uh, is a huge factor in the confidence of our, our children. Um, and their trajectory moving forward. And so they must have access to it. Um, national identity, well, people don't come to New Zealand to get a taste of Europe. They come to New Zealand because we are this amazing country on the other side of the earth that is unique to what they have to offer. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have an amazing uh, symphony orchestra and ballet, but our collaborations that exist across that sector or could exist um, make us unique to what the rest of the world has to offer. Uh, you've already made the point that there is economic value to our art sector, and it's important to note that. Uh, and the point has already been made too, that not only does it have a massive influence on the educational achievements and identity for our young people, but the mental well-being of New Zealanders as well. And so uh, national identity, a range of other factors, uh, it is huge, and that is why, as a government, we've made such a huge commitment to the sector, and we'll continue to do moving forward if we're re-elected. Jonathan Young. Uh, look, I think that's a great question, and um, I think it's, it kind of typifies the difference between a house and a home. It, it's 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 a, a house that is that has got life and people in it, and vibrancy is a home, and I think our nation um, needs to have that that life, that vibrancy, that connectivity, that mutual respect, that same time. And I think that that gives us confidence as people. It gives us pride as people, you know, that we are, uh, that, that we are unique um, and that we are a place that people want to come and visit and see not just the, not just who we are, but the values of what brings us together. And the arts, culture and heritage um, part of government, it, it can, sound so, um, I guess, um, officious, but actually what you're dealing with is, is the very Right, unfortunately, we have lost Jonathan, hopefully just momentarily, but we'll pick up you from this walk. Um, oh, hang on. Sorry, Jonathan, we did, we did lose you there. Would you like to just give us your final sentence there? Oh yeah, look, look I, I think there's room for some sort of intermediary either art agencies or, or, or whatever they may be right around the country that can connect to Ministry of Culture and Heritage and Creative NZ, uh, which tend to be a, a kind of Wellington centric um, organizations uh, to ensure that there's, there's equity around the country in terms of support and funding um, so that we actually see um, every attribute of our country um, recognised and enabled. Chloe Swarbrick. The question was, um, from my recollection, you know, what value does arts, culture and heritage provide to our identity and then what do we do to support or bolster that? Um, to provide as uh, quick <laughs> soundbite as possible, um, it provides the glue. Um, it is culture. And culture, by definition, from a design thinking perspective, is a shared set of values. 
And, you know, that shared set of values is what brings together a society that is by no means homogenous. You know, culture is often used as interchangeable with somebody's ethnicity or someone's geographical background or religion. But those things are proxies for understanding culture. They're not exactly the same thing nor synonymous. So um, for me, our culture as Aotearoa New Zealand, um, you know, as we've kind of uh, had little snippets of um, dialogue about today has massive potential to provide us platforms to meaningfully inspect who we are and who we can be to reflect on things really challenging topics like racism like sexism like homophobia uh, and to push us to develop further in all of the manifestations whether it's something like comedy or theater or music or slam poetry or physical art or photography or whatever else so in terms of how um, we do that and how we support our artists and our technicians I think it's moving away from just kind of seeing it as, as a nice to have and um, moving toward the genuine um, development of, of that strategy, of that long-term strategy and the money to back it up. Um, because we've seen from this government uh, that there is a commitment in this direction. Um, we just can't let it uh, exhaust after these two years. That two years has brought us some runway um, and we need to use those two years to continue not only moving forward, but operating in a very transformational manner because we have the opportunity to do so. So that leads to, well, what is essentially our second to last question. So will the candidates commit to resourcing, and we have talked about this, but let's go there again, commit to resourcing all relevant ministries to establishing an all of government task force to establish the long-term strategy for the arts in partnership with the sector, that's important, in partnership with the sector so the arts can work its magic across society. So we're asking each of you, will you commit tonight to resourcing all relevant ministries to establishing an all of government task force. Jonathan Young. Yeah, and I think the, the, the key word there is all relevant ministries. And I certainly know when it comes to um, exporting our, um, our craft and culture in terms of a um, whatever form it may take, um, then NZT's involvement would be really appreciated, really helpful. Um, in terms of opening up some markets for that, uh, whether that's um, music gaming, um, whatever it might be. Um, so look, I think that um, it's a matter of actually identifying the value uh, proposition that um, exists and making sure that those relevant ministries are connected to it. I think it's a very smart thing to do. And I think that we ought to uh, um, see that as, um, as a major benefit of actually promoting uh, Aotearoa New Zealand to the world. Yes. Sounds like a commitment to me. Let's go to Chloe Warbrick. Sorry, I missed that question amongst Jonathan's response. The oh, the commitment to the funding uh, and the creation of that task force. All relevant ministries to establishing all of government task force. I can tell you that if. Yeah, I can tell you that if there was 120 Green MPs, we'd get it done. Uh, but what I can say is that I'm more than happy to commit to working in partnership with our government partners to make that happen. Um, and I do think that there is the appetite to do so. Okay, and Carmel Cipolloni. Oh, you know, I agree with Chloe that the appetite is already there. So there's already conversations and work happening between ministries. I only talked about MEC because that's the other one I'm in charge of, but of course they're happening with MOE, they're happening with Ministry of Health, uh, they're happening with TPK, they're happening with MPP. Uh, so those are happening. If there needs to be a more formal task force to undertake this work, then that's certainly something that we can look at. If that is what the call is, and if people think that will ensure that we're more effective, then that's certainly something I'd be committing to exploring. Mm. Committing to exploring. Okay, yeah. all right. Last question to you all. What is oh. your best arts experience? Jonathan Young, let's start with you. Uh, look, I'd, I'd have to say that the, um, the best art experience I've had this year was at the uh, what's called the New Zealand Festival in Wellington. I'm not sure whether Auckland is like <laughs> it called down there, um, but I went on the Sunday evening and I heard um, uh, Christian Yavi uh, present a, an amazing um, 
concert with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, plus also his absolute ensemble. Um, at the end of that, I look, I have never been in a concert experience like it before. Um, it was incredibly moving and powerful. I loved every moment of it. Um, and that was on the 23rd of March this year. Thank you Two for that. Lockdowns. Thank you for that. Chloe Swarbrick. I used to run an art gallery, <laughs> so I won't claim that. Um, the, I mean, I could also potentially speak to the fact that, you know, growing up in and around basement theatre and kind of finding my feet with um, the Auckland uh, theatre companies, Young and Hungry, um, back when I was trying my hand and uh, obviously hanging up my hat later down the track in theatre. Um, I don't know whether it's Art in the Dark or it's The Other's Way, which I'm really gutted the second lockdown down meant we lost along Karanga Hape Road um, but it's probably on a daily basis or a regular basis rather um, first Thursdays along Karanga Hape Road and all the different manifestations of art and culture that come to light therein. Thank you for that and Carmel Sepuloni your your favorite arts experience. A fair lots but I'm going to um, refer to the opening of the Oceania exhibition in London and being alongside Māori and Pacific leaders from across the Pacific, uh, marching through London and then going through that exhibition and having the opportunity for each group to step up and bless those works. Uh, and the day after the opening, I have to say, the whole thing was so spiritual uh, for us as Māori and Pacific. Um, the front page wasn't about the exhibition. The front page and all of the news outlets were reporting that a beluga whale came up the Thames River uh, early hours of that morning uh, and us as Māori and Pacific totally claimed that beluga whale because uh, we know what that signifies. Very nice. So that was our final question but what we want to do before we wrap up is give each of our politicians the opportunity to leave a message for us this evening. Um, they've got a minute each to do it. Um, what order do we go in before? We, we'll do it in reverse order. So let's start with Jonathan Young. You've got one minute. Fantastic. Um, thank you, because why is always last, and it's nice to be first. Um, look, I believe that the the arts, culture and sector in particular has an opportunity before it that we must recognise and must prepare for. As the world um, gets ready in the next little while, let's hope it's soon, um, to be able to experience internationally again the different cultures and flavours that there are. And, um, and I think that uh, New Zealand hopefully being a, a must uh, visit destination that it creates the opportunity like never before for our cultural and arts sector to be able to showcase who we are confidently, our identity and, uh, and see, I think New Zealand celebrated uh, as a great nation. I'd love to see um, some work done on this, some preparation work, um, some investment work uh, so that we can make the very most of this opportunity, which I believe is before us and makes New Zealand, like I said, that must visit place in time to come. Thanks for that, Jonathan Young. Chloe Swarbrick. Um, so I first kind of got involved in arts, culture and heritage from the side of attempting to be a person who produced um, things like theatre and like did it myself. Um, I came to find that my talent and skills were not necessarily in the creativity side of things, but in attempting to produce things. And the main way that I did that was by bringing artists of different kind of disciplines together so that everybody was stronger as a collective. And I think that there's a real opportunity to do the same um, in this space. And I've kind of just flicked on to what's been happening in the comments on the spin-off. And I think that that indicates that there is a lot of passion about this area and all of the different manifestations of it. And I just hope that we see our strength and solidarity to push forward. My final thing um, to say would be, don't leave politics to the politicians. The reason that arts and culture has been so neglected for so long and seen as a nice to have is because it doesn't fit in with a very narrow view of economic success or GDP or any of those other kinds of things. And that's not to say that, you know, you don't need to take a pragmatic view, um, but it is to say that we fund what we value. So make yourselves valued and please get involved in the politics. Art is political. Thank you for that. Okay, and we're going to leave the last thought with you, Carmel Sipulon. Oh, you know, I agree with much of what's been said already, um, but what I recognise is that globally, 
uh, the art sector has been heavily impacted by COVID. Uh, and we want to continue to work hard alongside our art sector uh, to get us through this period, not just to survive, but to be sustainable. Um, and because we want to um, look forward to what we are going to look like and uh, how we're going to continue to celebrate ourselves here in New Zealand, uh, you know, through our arts. Um, can I say that the value is in the economic value, it is in well-being, and it is in our national identity and how we identi identify ourselves. And so let's continue to celebrate and work together to get through this period uh, and continue to have a thriving arts sector moving forward. Fantastic. Thank you both. Uh, thank you all rather very much for that. Carmel Cipolloni, uh, Chloe Swarbrick and Jonathan Young. Uh, we're really grateful that you're here tonight. Um, wonderful to hear your views, to hear your vision. We're looking forward particularly seeing uh, Nationals and Labour's arts policies come out. Um, at the whānau, we didn't get to all of your questions, uh, but we will send those on to the candidates and hopefully they'll be able to uh, share their answers to them. And hopefully those answers will speak to an authentic and ongoing commitment to the arts sector and its long-term health. I don't think there's really any doubt about that though from this evening. Uh, we do know that radical change is possible. One thing that, that COVID has taught us is that when we're under pressure, when we're in crisis, we will change the world, we'll stop our lives, we'll lock down, we'll homeschool, we'll stay from, away from each other and we will wear masks. We will fundamentally turn our reality upside down and government will find the money to do things that were perhaps until then considered unthinkable. We have proven that we can actually meet need when we're forced to, but we don't want crisis and force to meet need and inspire change. We have the opportunity to imagine something right now, something sustainable, something revolutionary, uh, and something radically creative. This is the moment to change the future for this sector. So on behalf of Te Taumata Toi, our iwi and our toi uh, advocacy network, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks to our partners, the spin-off, the big idea in Auckland Live. Big gratitude to Melody and uh, to Stephanie from ISAN, from Deaf Aotearoa. And of course, another big thanks to our politicians this evening, Chloe Swarbrick, Jonathan Young and Carmel Sepuloni. Thank you for being here. And thank you everyone for allowing me to be a part of this evening. It really has been a privilege. Uh, e te whānau toi, tēnei te mihi nunui ki a koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Uh, it's time now to formally close our evening, so I'll hand back to Enon Delamere uh, now for a karakia whakamutsuna. Ko marie. Um, tau toko na ngā mihi ki a koutou i ngā, i ngā rangatire whaki atu i ngā kōrero. Uh, mi noi tātou. A tēnei rā te mauri nui, te mauri roa, te mauri tapu, te mauri i ka whakapiki, te mauri i ka whakakake. Te mauri o enei tunga, te mauri o tēnei tauira. Te mauri ki runga, te mauri ki raro, te mauri ka apute ki te whai au ki te au mārama. Auhi, wero, tawana mai te mauri, haumi e, hui e, tāiki e. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.